introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Beard has received many uh, awards and lots of recognition for his professional accomplishments in the area of uh, photoelectronics, uh, photonics, light emitting devices, and light emitting light sensing devices. Um, he will introduce a little bit more about his technical background and such during the talk, but I would like to add that he is a, uh, a fellow of IEEE. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineers. Uh, I consider him to be a national treasure and a regional treasure. So it's a very great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, James uh, R. Beard. Before Dr. Beard starts, uh, let me also add one other thing, excuse me, Larry. And that is, because we're videotaping this, it probably would be best if you save your questions and answers for the end. Okay? I don't know if Dr. Beard will ask any any code questions, but regardless, uh, if you have questions, please feel free and ask, but the only thing is we ask that you wait until the end of the presentation. Thank you. Like uh, Sam Villarreal, who just introduced me, I'm an Aggie. Uh, graduated from Texas A&M in 1954 with a B.S. degree in electrical engineering. Went on to graduate school, got my M.S. degree in January of 56, my Ph.D. in June of 57. That happened because I had all my coursework done for my Ph.D. before I got around to writing my master's thesis is the reason it did. Turned out that way. Now, I'm uh, 70 years old and stutter. I've been doing that for about 65 years, uh, and now you know it too. <laughs> so if I get hung up on a word, you'll know I'm not having a fit or something. You know what's happening. <laughs> I think I'll get through this all right. Uh, Bill Shockley invented the transistor at least at least wrote his book out of Bell Labs in 1948 is the year I graduated from high school. Uh, then I got, went on to A&M and got my degrees down there. Gary Pittman, my colleague who is shown on this first slide, has a BS in chemistry from SMU. Uh, I got my PhD one Friday evening and I went to work at TI the next Monday morning. Uh, we moved over the weekend. Uh, June the 3rd, 1957, and uh, that's when my education in semiconductors began. Uh, my undergraduate work was heavily oriented towards power, rotating machinery, transformers, motors, generators, things of the sort. My graduate work was on a vacuum tube analog computer with plus and minus 300 volt. Uh, power supplies. Uh, I designed several vacuum tube DC amplifiers uh, and had one course on transistors in my entire college career. Uh, my first assignment at uh, Texas Instruments was uh, designing a low frequency reactance amplifier for use in seismometers. Gary Pittman, my colleague, had been working on gallium arsenide solar cells. And uh, these two uh, projects uh, served as well because it introduced me to parametric amplifiers and it introduced Gary to the technology of gallium arsenide. TI had quite a development effort on gallium arsenide at the time. It was sort of a vague theory that since Silicon was better for transistors than gallium arsenide. Silicon had a wider band gap than, I mean, silicon was better than germanium. Silicon had a wider band gap than germanium. So gallium arsenide with a wider band gap than silicon should have been an even better choice for transistors. But the gallium arsenide transistors were very elusive. Uh, didn't really turn out that way. It's only Recently, the, the technology has caught up to the point where good gallium arsenide transistors can be built. In 1959, uh, TI had a need for low noise parametric amplifiers for X band radar receivers. 
the high electron mobility of gallium arsenide made it the material of choice for these reactor diodes. Uh, I knew about parametric amplifiers, Gary knew about gallium arsenide, so we got teamed up uh, to build gallium arsenide reactor diodes. And overnight I went from 10 hertz to 10 gigahertz. Uh, <laughs> so that was quite a jump in frequency. The gallium arsenide reactors were made by diffusing zinc in intact bulk crystals of gallium arsenide. We used an electroless plated nickel contact uh, for the n-type contact and a zinc gold alloy contact for the B uh, on the contact. We found out that the electroless nickel worked only because it had a lot of sulfur in it. We tried evaporating pure nickel and we didn't get any kind of normal contact at all. So it only worked because of one of the uh, contaminants in the, uh, the electroless plating solution. Uh, we put a gold ball bond on the top of the device, uh, pulled the lead off of it, and used that as a mass for etching the mesa on the reactor diodes. Very uh, etched the mesas by hand using a mixture of aquaregia and HF. Probably not an OSHA approved process. Uh, not what you'd call a manufacturing process today. But the technology of the gallium arsenide was growing and improving all the time. About this time, my boss, Bob Pritchard, came back from the device research conference with a report about the Asaki diode, the tunnel diode. Uh, after hearing this report, Gary dug down in his beaker of rejects. He had a, about a 500 milliliter beaker of reject bracket diodes, and he found several little diodes at a certain right, about an inch. Uh, and we had been building tunnel diodes and throwing them away. As Liza read that, there's another one of those strange IV curves. So we <laughs> didn't know enough <laughs> physics to realize that this might have any practical value at all. Uh, you probably can't even buy a tunnel diode today, but they made quite a splash in the electronics industry back in the late 50s. We'd been building by accident and throwing them away. Now these tunnel diodes we made were made by alloying 10 dots in the degenerate P-type gallium arsenide. The 10 owner concentration was quite high and uh, that's when I found out about uh, the tunneling phenomena. A two to one change in the P-doping dots into would change the peak current density by five orders of magnitude. So these devices had to be manually hand etched because you couldn't control the peak current density. So you had to change the area to make the devices come out with the same peak current. Now some of these tunnel diodes had a poor peak to value ratio. And I'll show you a characteristic of the tunnel diode in a minute, and you'll see what I mean. The alley current on some devices was very noisy. Had a lot of 1 over F noise. I came up with a very flawed model. Uh, in fact, it was whole cloth. There was nothing about it that was right. But uh, I was trying to describe this very noisy current in the value region of the tunnel diode is some sort of radiative recombination generation where a photon would be emitted it would stimulate other centers to discharge and uh, give this very uh, uh, chaotic appearing noise. Um, based on this flawed model, uh, lasers were very popular at the time. All sorts of new lasers were being announced. Uh, I thought it might be possible to use this as stimulated emission to make a gallium arsenide laser diode. So I took my idea across the street to the physics research lab at TI, and uh, they showed me the Shockley von Rusbeck paper and uh, convinced me, based on data taken on 
silicon that band to band recombination in semiconductors was uh, not very probable. So you likely wouldn't be able to make a diode laser. Uh, I didn't know any better than to believe what they told me. <laughs> uh, I knew Gallagher Marsh and I had a direct band gap because we were building tunnel diodes, but neither I nor Gary nor the people in the physics lab at TI at the time had an understanding that this would also affect the radiative recombination of the material. 